So what I wanted to show you was, uh, and this is really the, 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 second, the second demo, I wanted to show you sort of the power of using these higher availability modes and uh, how you can use very high lossy ISP links and get a very nice clean signal through for a real-time traffic application like, like video. So for this case, I need to just quickly jump to Okay, so I'm just going to restart the browser. And I'm going to just quick set up, going to remove the history, right? So clean, clean experiment from, from the start. So I'll clear all the history from the video browser. So the good video you'll get will actually not be something that is cached. And then we'll go back to, we're using Plex for the video server. So it's essentially server on one edge connect, client on, on the other side. Log in here. Windows 10. So I'll start the, 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 the video. So what I should, what I should add is You'll see the video is starting here, right? It's counting, you'll see the <coughs> seconds go by. Um, nice, clean video. This is over two links with no loss. And so as I fumble around with Windows here, so essentially I have um, a good links, good links configuration for my uh, wine emulator. So there's 0% loss here, right? So what I've done is I've applied a policy for my network right now, which is in this orchestrator, which is I'm using high efficiency, right? So I'm not trying to do any correction. I'm passing one packet up one path, the second packet, the next path, and so on and so forth. And that happens to work well because there's no issues with the link. But now what I'm going to do where things get a little bit more interesting is I'm going to introduce 10% loss on each one of my links. And as you know, you've probably all seen at home at one point or another, video doesn't really tend to behave too happily in, in that kind of situation. So I'm going to jump ahead here of where my buffer was because the application was pre-buffering. So you all, right, you start to see the issues. Basically, it's, it's, it's trying to catch up, it can't. Let's, let's just give it a few more seconds. All right, it got one frame. All right, so it's kind of struggling, right? Your connection to the server is not fast, blah, 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 right? So we've all, we've all seen that at home. Now what I'll do is I'll go back to uh, my orchestrator and I'll say, actually, I really care about this traffic, so I'm going to turn on the high availability mode where I'm using both paths, but I'm using it for quality as opposed to uh, high throughput. And so I'm going to apply this change. There we go. Um, and you can actually see on the graphs of the device, right? So what happened here with the nice high line was that was our original feed. Then it dropped down once I introduced the loss. And as you can see now, it's, it's essentially recovering. So we can go back to the video. And I'll jump ahead again so that it's a clean experiment. And you'll see that the video is fine, right? So that's, that's essentially the power of being able to use the correction from one link and so with 10% on each one of those, statistically, you're, 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 you're still getting uh, throughout less than 1% loss. Um, let's do one more, since we're talking about failover, let's do one more test. I'm just gonna take one of, one of the links down entirely. So let's, let's uh, go back and to do that, we'll just kind of revert to our old setup. I'm going to set 
go back to the good links. And what we're going to do is we're going to take down one of the links, right? So, you know, your choice, right? We can fail MPLS, we can fail internet. So we're going to fail MPLS. Down, obviously the video, video is still running. And so what you'll see happen is I failed my MPLS, obviously the throughput's fallen to zero and you're picking up the traffic on the other hand side. What's visible in the graph, but not so much in the real video is that not a single packet was lost by doing that, right? So that's, that's really the, the it's, it's sub-second failover. Right. So that's really one of the key things that you will not get from sort of a routing reconvergence or some other thing in the background. So that's one of the advantages of doing uh, true multipathing in, in, uh, in the NVO. Okay, so what happens in the case where the offered bandwidth, the, the offered load is greater than a single link? Let's, let's just use your example. We yep. have two links. Yep. And one of the links dies, as you just gave the example. Yep. And now the offered load is greater than the resulting bandwidth. Yes, so obviously the application will throttle back at that point. Now, with the overlays... It depends on the application. <laughs> it, depends on the, it depends on the application. But one thing you'll notice... If it's TCP-based, it will. If it's UDP, right. it won't. <laughs> yes, so to your point, right? If, if you have one link and you're UDP and it's wanting to send the 10 megs and you have a 1 meg link, you're not going to get your 10 megs, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's just the reality of it. Uh, what you can do, though, and I should have mentioned that in the business intent overlay, you can associate a traffic class. You can associate QS and different class of service marking for mm -hmm. different applications. So in the case where you have a link that is now overcommitted, mm -hmm. at least you can make a decision of my backup app is going to get hit on the head a lot more than my voice application, right? So I can... I so can I do that in the orchestrator setting up the policies? Yes. Okay. Yes. So okay. this policy will be managed across that entire overlay to each one of the edge connects. So you can make sort of a high level decision of somebody, somebody, somebody's going to get hurt, right? In that one right. 10 meg to one meg <laughs> link. <laughs> <laughs> who's going to get chopped, right? So that's... that's yeah, I just so. did a blog post on, on uh, UC over SDN or SD-WAN, and that was one of the things, is a bunch of people had quoted, oh, we have these links, and they're, they're active standby mm -hmm. <laughs> or active backup, and that's just wasting half of my money. I want to be able to use all that. Well, there's a risk there that when one of the two links goes down, assuming you have two, then you're overcommitted, how does it handle that situation? Yes, yeah. So you, you do, you know, you, you, you still need to do some, some planning ahead of time. Where this makes it easier, though, is when you plan, you know, this, my demo network on a sheet of paper, whatever decisions I've made in terms of what the policy is that a certain application will get in case of failure and who gets to fail over and who doesn't. So when Damon said, you know, maybe my guest Wi-Fi doesn't get to fail over mm -hmm. to my LTE, right? Notice I didn't even actually yeah. check anything here, right? I can check a backup or not. So if your LTE is your <coughs> failover and your best effort, your Facebook, your maybe even your guest Wi-Fi, don't check the box and, and it's not going to take away from that capacity. Okay. But you do have to do a little bit of budgeting ahead of time, obviously. Right. But at least once you've decided what it is, you know that each box will consistently apply the policy and it's not going to be, oops, the guy that did this box forgot this, this ACL or whatever. Can I make it, one of the comments that I get, I've talked about SD-WAN a lot lately. Mm -hmm. and one of the comments I get is engineers always go, oh, but what will happen? You know, it'll stop working when one of them fails. You've mm -hmm. got to stop looking at the glass as being half full, <laughs> half empty and see it as half full, right? Mm -hmm. The answer is you're getting everything that you paid for as the normal default. Mm -hmm. And the circuit only degrades under exceptional circumstances. Right, this is I a want... highly positive outcome. It's not yes. worse, it's significantly better. But I wanted to make sure that there were controls there for determining which traffic got preference sure. in the degraded The same case. way that we do in our networks today, right? Yes, the cost exactly. policies don't change. We didn't reinvent that wheel. Mm -hmm. Nothing's so changed. It's I just the that, path selection. It's an opportunity yeah. to put more beer in. So what um, we're doing is, that I think the point here is, is that you're using both links and routers mm -hmm. and devices simultaneously. So your entire WAN investment is actually working for the first time And you're getting better performance. Years. Okay? And you yes. get better performance right. in the normal case. Yes. The worst case is that half your care will go away mm -hmm. and you'll be working half, 
at half pace. Mm -hmm. Instead of your best case being you'll be working at half pace. Mm -hmm. So you have to go to the business and communicate effectively and say, this isn't a bad thing. This is the best thing we could ever do. Instead of spending $10 million a year on our WAN costs and getting $5 million worth of useful Great. bandwidth, <laughs> I'm getting $10 million and occasionally it'll be degraded. Mm -hmm. It's just a perception issue. Mm -hmm. So the, the sh shaping traffic class we're putting on here is at the business intent policy level, which is applied to a virtual overlay, right? Correct. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so if I have... Yeah, let's say non-enterprise apps, internet for my, for mm -hmm. my business intent <clears throat> policy, within that class, because I'm I, I, there must be like a hierarchy of QoS, right, that says, okay, this overlay is going to get on the line before this one, because that's what's said in the business intent policy. Mm -hmm. But within that, there may be multiple qualities of service, assuming we, uh, we trust what's sent to us from, from the LAN. Yes. Yeah. So is, is it almost like a, you know, here's your first tier of QoS, and... Within that, well, we'll send it based on the QoS markings of the packets that get mapped into that class. Uh, yes. So, oversimplifying. So the, there's there's essentially two main elements of, of QoS, and I just pull this up so you can kind of see the uh, there's there's the QoS policy, which is essentially mapping a certain subnet. Perhaps it could be tagged based on a certain DSCP value. But we also uh, keep in mind for each one of these tunnels and these overlay type of tunnels, we have shapers. Mm -hmm. And so you can do things like defining traffic classes. So we support up to 10 traffic classes. Um, real time, right, where you can essentially allocate sort of how it's going to do the weighting of the, the, the bandwidth to a certain um, class. So even though you may want your real time traffic to have precedence over some of the other classes, you probably don't want to just give it 100% of the bandwidth, right? So you have that flexibility of essentially setting a minimum bandwidth guarantee as well as a maximum bandwidth so the other ones are not fully starved out. Yeah, and then inside a class, we do weighted fair queuing. So the, um, this, there's a hierarchy of, of shaping and classes with absolute priority and then bandwidth caps and then excess weighting. So you can kind of configure things to, if you, if you want to do a really simple absolute priority scheme, you can. If you want to do something that's class-based queuing with no absolute priorities and everything being weight-based, you can do that. And then um, inside a class in the hierarchy, at the very lowest level, it's flow-by-flow -flow weighted fair queuing. Um, and that, that's sort of how that all works. In a class. Okay. And w when we're defining uh, the QoS policies, for example, how we, if, we, if we're not basing it on the received DSCP, uh, are there predefined applications, so I can say VoIP, right? And so somehow we're identifying voice yes. over IP. Um, what's the source of those applications and how, how do we, <coughs> I guess. Yes. So, how many so million applications do you have? <laughs> yeah, so it's, a bit, it's tricky to count, right? So we have um, built-in apps which are based on ports and DPIs, and there's about a thousand of those. And then there's internet apps. And so there we are looking at the, um, the domain or the, um, the subnet and IPs that the traffic's going to on the internet. And we've uh, got that set up so that we can do up to 500,000. Um, right now, we're supporting the top 500, but the architecture goes to 500,000 um, web applications. And then um, the users can define their own applications based on a, on a tuple, which is yeah. going to show. We're coming back to the, the web app SaaS stuff yeah. later, right? I, uh, was there? I'm not sure. Um, we'll, do, we'll do the, Z, the Zscaler piece uh, in a minute. But what did you mean by um, Because you've got optimizations for cloud-based apps, mm -hmm. right? So is that something you're coming to later in the presentation? Is something you're talking about? I wasn't going to. But it's an important can, we can, feature. We can, we can no, we, I think we, yeah, we, did, um, we covered that in the, back in May. We, we did talk yeah. about the, um, what we do for SaaS apps. And so I don't think we were including that today. Okay. But um, basically what we do there is for um, the top um, 50 or 100 um, SaaS sites, we're always adding new ones. So I don't know the exact number. We look at what subnets they're using, and within the subnets they're using around the globe, 
what are some of the key servers that we can do pings or HTTP pings against to get latency and loss measurements. Mm -hmm. And so then we're looking at, um, just like we do multipathing interior between Silver Peaks, where we're bookended, like that's kind of the equivalent of OSPF, where we're doing measurement second by second choice of path based on our tunnel measurements. Mm -hmm. When we're going up to SAS, we're one-sided. So we do things a little bit differently. We make do the measurements with HTTP mm -hmm. pings and from different gateways, and then look at, for me here in the branch, is the best way to get to Salesforce to go direct to net, or should I go over MPLS, and then once I'm on my MPLS gateway network, should I be going out the Washington DC gateway, the LA gateway, or the Chicago gateway? And so what's happening is, at each of those gateways, they're pinging the top 50 SaaS services, well, the ones that you, that customer's using, and advertising that information back into the network. So it's measurement-based routing for exterior routes. So it's kind of if the interior routing that we've talked about today, that's measurement-based interior routing corresponds to OSPF. Mm -hmm. The SAS stuff is measurement-based exterior routing to find the best route to a external service um, like SAS. So that's that in a nutshell. Cool. Um, but maybe another session um, in the future, uh, we can go more into that. Yeah, that's fine. That's, that's good for today. Thank you for including that.